Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, welcome on the second seminar on Imperialist Mode of Living. My name is Joost Geertz. I represent the SOC 21, the Socialist Research Collective here in the Netherlands. And we have this meeting together with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, um, which we are very proud of this collaboration. And yesterday we had a very an uh, interesting day with a very um, vibrant discussion and we hope to can continue this uh, today. Uh, just a few technical things on the, um, under your screen, you see a Q&A. Q&A, uh, particularly for the attendees, you are um, entitled to um, pose a question to the, uh, the speaker or to the organizers or make a comment um, that will be read by um, Herman Peterson, one of us uh, from the board, and that will be read aloud. You are not able as an attendee uh, to, to speak. This is uh, a prerogative of the panelists. Don't use the chat because that we will not use as such. Um, let's do, use the Q&A only. And if panelists wants to intervene, then they have to raise their hand. You see in the right hand side, you see a hand. If you click on that, uh, I see that you raise your hand and then you will give him the floor um, uh, with uh, for the discussion. Um, I will um, chair the, the morning session. Marcel from the Linde will uh, chair the um, afternoon session. And then, well, in the, um, Overall discussion, I think I will take uh, over again for Marcel because, of course, he has to answer all the impossible questions which come to the fore in uh, the discussion of today. Um, well, our first speaker is uh, Bob Yesup from Lancaster, um, uh, the rise and fall of the Fordist Castle. And, um, well, uh, he, he sent in a beautiful PowerPoint, and I hope. He can make that uh, in about half an hour, which we dedicated to him. So I give the floor to Bob and um, wish you a very productive day and a very good uh, discussion afterwards. So please, Bob. The okay. floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just pull up my PowerPoint. Right. So I'll be talking about the rise and crisis of Fordism and the imperial mode of living. And as Nailing suggested yesterday, the imperial mode of living is based on critical political ecology, regulation theory, and hegemony. And I'll be discussing those issues in my presentation. I'll be focusing on the imperial mode of living, the fundamental contradictions of the capital relation, dealing with accumulation regimes and modes of regulation, institutional fixes and spatio-temporal fixes, and then I'll be turning to Atlantic Fordism and its crisis and discussing what replaces Atlantic Fordism, and I'll be considering the knowledge-based economy and finance-dominated accumulation. So just to summarize from Brandt and Disson's book, they summarized the imperial mode of living in the following terms. In sum, the imperial mode of living intends to better understand the global constellation of power whoops, and domination that is reproduced through innumerable strategies, practices, and intended consequences at all spatial scales, from bodies, minds, and everyday actions, through regions and nationally organized societies, to the largely invisible and consciously concealed structures that enable global interactions. That mode also reproduces largely destructive society nature relations, which imply enormous transfers of biophysical material. This happens within regions and countries, but also at a global scale, and is represented by relations of domination, which it simultaneously reproduces. And I want to argue that we can understand this in terms of a Marxian view of capitalism, 
which involves wealth appearing as an immense accumulation of commodities, the commodity form being generalized to labor power. It involves the world market as a presupposition and result of capitalism, and it involves the role of competition in the dynamic of capital accumulation. And I want to stress here, the world market as the presupposition and as the result of capitalism, because this is a key issue of the imperial mode of living. In yesterday's presentations, we saw the world market presented in almost world systems theoretical terms, in terms of the relationship between core, semi, semi periphery, and periphery. And I think this is a misleading way of dealing with it. Equally misleading is to ID identify national varieties of capitalism. And my approach is to think in terms of the world market as the presupposition but as an emerging result of the con continued capital accumulation on a global scale with different varieties of capitalism linked together in the shadow of one or another form of capitalism. So we'll be dealing with Atlantic Fordism in the shadow of US imperialism, and we'll be dealing with post Fordism in terms of the imperial rivalries between different capital accumulation systems. In terms of the foundational contradictions, I won't go into this in detail, I'll send the PowerPoint later, but we can see every contradiction has a value aspect and a material aspect. So the commodity is exchange value and use value, labor power is abstract labor on concrete skills, the wage is a cost of production or a source of demand. Money can be interest bearing capital or measure of value or international currency and national money and so forth. And I'll be dealing with these when I deal with Fordism and its successor accumulation regimes. In terms of spatio-temporal fixes, this is crucial for understanding the political ecology and regulation theoretical dimensions of capital accumulation and modes of regulation. Spatio-temporal fixes are ways in which the relative partial and provisional structural coherence of a given accumulation regime and its mode of regulation are secured. The spatial aspects is displacing the contradictions and the external costs, including biophysical costs of accumulation are displaced elsewhere, and the temporal aspect is deferring them into the future. So we can understand any accumulation regime that tends to be stable as being stable because it displaces the costs of stability elsewhere or defers them into the future. And in this regard, spatio-temporal fixes are crucial aspects of the imperial mode of living. Even so, we find within a stable system that some classes, class fractions, social categories, or other social forces located within the boundaries of the imperial mode of living are marginalized, excluded, or subject to coercion, which is an aspect of the hierarchization of the imperial mode of living. In terms of the relationship between spatio-temporal fixes and the world market, the world market is not seamlessly integrated through trade, but develops in an uneven and combined manner. It's marked by temporary zones of relative stability and instability, li linked to unequal capacities that displace or defer basic contradictions, crisis tendencies, and conflicts. And associated spatio-temporal fixes have mutually reinforcing set of structural, organizational, and institutional forms that are key aspects of competitiveness and shape spatio-temporal rhythms. But the uneven development also disrupts established spatio-temporal fixes and associated identities, subjectivities, modes of calculation, 
and spatiotemporal horizons of action. And I'm arguing that any stability that exists is only ever purely temporary and depends upon the ability to displace and defer contradictions elsewhere. Now, this is how I'm going to present the Atlantic Fordist spatiotemporal fix in the global north. And I think one of the aspects of the book on the imperial mode of living that is often ignored in regulation theory is the extent to which Atlantic Fordism in the global north depends upon exploiting nature elsewhere. So I'm arguing that Atlantic Fordist spatiotemporal fix the two main contradictions that are handled within the mode of regulation are the wage relation and the context of money. And the wage is seen primarily as a source of demand and only secondarily is it handled as a social cost of production. And money is handled primarily as national money rather than as institute, international currency. And we'll see this changing when we go to the crisis of Atlantic Fordism. The key institutional, oh, sorry. Sorry, this is the spatiotemporal fix. So the wage relation is primarily handled as demand and as cost. National money is primary and international currency is secondary. The key institutional fix of the wage relation is the Keynesianism in demand management and rising productivity based on an institutionalized class compromise. And the spatiotemporal fix was associated with the creation of national economies within which the wage relation was handled. The aspect of nas national money was handled through Keynesianism and international currency dealt with through the Bretton Woods agreements and the dominant role of the United States um, dollar in managing Atlantic Fordism also on a global scale. And the spatiotemporal fix was managing international relations. The state was primarily there for social cohesion, and this involved the welfare state and spatial planning in the global north and involved the national state as the primary spatio-temporal fix within which this occurred. Capital was handled primarily as productive capital, as a stock of assets for valorization in particular times and places, and money as the most abstract expression of capital available for investing anywhere in the world was the second aspect. And the key institutional fix here was reinvested Fordist profits and the financing of mass consumption. And this primary spatiotemporal fix was maintaining the cohesion of the circuits of Atlantic Fordism and imperialism. And what's ignored in the regulation approach is the importance of nature relations with nature seen as resources from the world market and sinks in spaceship Earth considered a uh, secondary. And this involved the key institutional fix of nested imperial subordination within the shadow of United States Fordism with coercion applied in the South and the center semi periphery nexus maintained as the spatiotemporal fix. And I can illustrate the key institutional fix of nested imperialism in terms of the fact that Atlantic Fordism depended on increasing supplies of increasingly cheap, cheap oil in oil exporting regions. And in that sense, we can say that the institutional fix of Atlantic Fordism depended on military coercion and military dictatorships in the oil exporting regions. In terms of the crisis of Atlantic Fordism. We looks, this table looks to be similar, but it is different because the primary aspect of the contradiction is that the wage is increasingly seen as an international cost of production, 
and its demand role in maintaining demand becomes less significant. And the key institutional crisis is the internationalization of the wage relation uh, in causing the instability of the wage relation in a stable global fordism. And this is reflected in terms of the increasing inability of national states to manage international crisis and maintain the wage relationship. In terms of money, the internationalization of currency relations becomes a primary aspect and it becomes increasingly difficult for Keynesianism to work with the breakdown of Bretton Woods and the change in the role of the United States dollar as it becomes off the gold standard in 1971. And this leads to a crisis in international relations. The state is destabilized by the rise of increasing social exclusion and the rise of new social movements outside the institutionalized class compromise. And this is seen in terms of fiscal rationality, legitimacy and hegemonic prices and the declining power of most national states. Money is increasingly circulating in terms of money as the most abstract expression of capital available for investment anywhere in the world, including um, in the semi-periphery and periphery, and its role as a stock of fixed assets is subordinate. This leads to the disruption of the Fortis circuits and the rise of peripheral Fortis exploitation, both within the circuits of North Atlantic Fordism, think, for example, of the rise of Southern Europe, but also the rise of other um, peripheries and semi-peripheries in the rest of the world. And increasingly in the crisis of Atlantic Fordism, nature becomes seen as a sink and there's a resource search in the global south to enable this to happen. And this leads to imperial resistance in the semi-periphery and the imposition of structural conditionalities to try to maintain the spatio-temporal fix. That's a summary of what I've said, and we're now going to talk about what is post-Fordism. And there was a search for what would replace Fordism, and I think this is seen in what we call post-Fordism, because if we thought about what post-Ford, what Fordism is, we could call it post-liberalism, but it doesn't tell us anything other than it's what comes after Fordism. And in terms of the search for post-Fordist economies, we can see a productive capital viewpoint that it will be knowledge-based economy. And the other is a financial viewpoint of what replaces Fordism, which is finance-dominated accumulation. What I've done here, and I won't go into detail, is to sketch what the institutional fix is and spatio-temporal fixes of a knowledge-based economy would be, and that would be treating capital as primarily the valorization of knowledge and design-intensive capital, with capital functioning secondly as intellectual property, and competition being the secondary contradiction as innovation-led Schumpeterian competition involving a race to the bottom and fall out from creative destruction. And there are also other aspects here, which I've thought of as a thought experiment, of what would be the key institutional fixes and the key spatio-temporal fixes of a stable knowledge-based economy. In terms of the aspect of nature, it would involve innovation in access to resources on a global scale and innovation in value cycles innovation in sync capacities, the hierarchy of a green bioeconomy, and the global south being seen as resources and sink. But that knowledge-based economy, although it became the hegemonic economic imaginary after Fordism, actually was dominated by finance-dominated accumulation as the stable regime. And here, I presented what, as what I understand to be 
the emerging neoliberal finance dominated accumulation as the supposed solution for the crises of Fordism. And I'm looking here now at capital as the primary contradiction and the social wage relation as the primary contradictions that need managing in this accumulation regime, with capital as a main aspect being fast hypermobile money and derivatives as the general form, and only secondarily the handling of capital as the valorization of capital as a fixed asset to be valorized in specific time and places. The key institutional fix is the deregulation of financial markets and the state targeting price stability, not jobs. And the spatio-temporal fix is free trade with national or regional state controls. And in terms of the social wage relation, the function of wage is to be primarily a private wage plus credit as a demand source, and the social wage is treated secondarily as an international cost of production. And this is associated with the promotion of flexibility in terms of hire and fire, in terms of flexibility, in terms of working hours, and in terms of new forms of credit. And spatio-temporally, we see a war for talents plus a race to the bottom for most workers and the squeezed middle. The state is primarily neoliberal. It has flanking measures to support the neoliberalism when it's in crisis, such as the third wave. The key institutional fix is the free market plus the strong state or authoritarian statism. We see the decline, in other words, of post-war democracy. And the spatio-temporal fix is endorsing intensified uneven development at many sites and scales. In terms of the international regime, it needs to create the space of flows for all forms of capital, and it needs to compensate for uneven development and adapt to the rising economic powers, such as the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which is leading to the Washington census and the post-Washington consensus. And in terms of nature, we see the rise of neo-extractivism and the expansion of industrial agriculture, the proposal for carbon pricing and ecological modernization. And in terms of the spatio-temporal fix, a global carbon market and green grabbing. This would be a finance dominated accumulation regime in stability. And now I'll deal with the finance dominated accumulation regime in crisis. And what we're seeing now is the system in crisis. We see that emerging really from 2000 onwards, the rising antagonism between Main Street and Wall Street or between Main Street and the city of London, epic recessions dominated by debt default deflation dynamics or D4, the deregulation leads to a crisis of predatory, too big to fail finance and contagion effects, and the rise of protectionism in the core economies and growing resistance to free trade in the periphery. In terms of the social wage, we see a credit crunch, which reverses the reliance of growing consumption on private credit, and we need leading to austerity and double dip recessions. The growing reserve army of surplus labor leads to growing precarity, and the global crisis leads to internal devaluation and reproduction crisis. In terms of the state, we see that the increasing importance of political factors in maintaining neoliberalism undermines order liberalism and austerity policies meet resistance and lead to harsher discipline. Crises in political markets reinforce post-democracy. And we see that spatio-temporally, it's not possible to halt uneven development. 
in the global regime, we're seeing an increasingly unregulated space of foes intensifying the de debt default deflation dynamics, multilateral multiscalar imbalances and a race to the bottom, the crisis and rejection of the Washington consensus, the crisis of the United States hegemony with the rise of the BRICS being in crisis and disarray, lost biodiversity, a crisis of unequal exchange and the end of cheap neighbor, cheap nature, the existential insecurity in the global south and lack of resources, new forms of imperialism, particularly associated with the rise of China and new forms of multilateral partnerships. I don't know how much longer I've got. Oh, I can see the, the clock on Joost's screen. So I'll continue uh, that explanation. What I want to say here is the North Atlantic financial crisis emerged directly from capitalist speculation and finance rather than a specific type of free trade in markets and capitalist production. It was enabled by unusual deals with political authority, the deregulation of finance via legal changes and regulatory capture, and predatory political profits, tax cuts for the rich, welfare cuts, privatization, disaster capitalism. But it takes a specific form because we're seeing the hyper financialization of the advanced neoliberal economies, and in particular, and most immediately, practices of deregulated, opaque, and sometimes fraudulent financial institutions. So we discussed yesterday whether financial capitalism is returning from the pre fordist period. And I want to say that there is a resurrection of financial capital, but it takes the form of hyper-financialization because of its context of neoliberalism, and in particular, the increasingly opaque and intransparent ways, the fraudulent ways in which financial institutions work. Now I'll turn to the Green New Deal as the alternative. And what I want to do here is to present in terms of the same thought experiment, what would an ecologically friendly no growth regime look like? And we'll see here the limits of thinking in terms of capitalist categories, because I'm having to think in terms of the same categories of thought that enable me to construct my other stable regime. But we can see that when we turn to the category of capital, we're looking at a low carbon economy in which capital functions as commons rather than as private capital. It's possessed by co-ops. The key institutional fix is to promote the solar solidarity economy, which is oriented to allocative and distributive justice. And the spatio-temporal fix is local and slow, but with appropriate forms of local redistribution. The enterprise form will be not-for-profit, innovation-led Schumpeterian competition, and solidarity would limit for the race to the bottom and its fallout. The key institutional fix would be embedded cooperation, as we see in Montragon, and we're seeing distributed no growth, degrowth, and slow growth in order to balance out an equal development in the global economy. The social wage would be a source of demand based on green recovery. There'd be flex security in the Dutch style for full employability with new work-life balance. Whoops. Policies for innovation-led sustainable degrowth, neo-communitarian neo Schumpeterian welfare post-national regime is the new type of welfare state. And nature functions primarily as spaceship Earth and degrowth is emphasized. Food and energy sovereignty and solidarity matter. And the global South tries to impose unilateral decolonization. In other words, it doesn't request to be liberated, but imposes 
it's universe, universalizing global self decolonization. That explains that. And then I'm going to argue that the global New Deal has the risk that it be recaptured by neoliberalism in terms of cap and trade rather than being articulated to challenge the economic logic that's created environmental, energy, food, and water crises. We are seeing a zombie neoliberalism, which is colonizing GND, Green New Deal, turning into a nothing green strategy. And there's a risk that the Green New Deal becomes part of the new imperial strategy through which the North maintains its living standards by paying for slower, slower growth in the dependent South. And we're seeing valuable lessons on how to develop post neoliberal Green New Deal from outside neoliberal heartlands, for example, the development of neo extractivism in Latin America. And these are my conclusions. What's to be done? The crisis of neoliberalism on a global scale does not mean that neoliberal era has ended. It will continue to have path dependent effects many years, much depends on how the current crisis is interpreted and resolved in key and on key economic spaces and states. And we have to get involved in the struggle to interpret the crisis of neoliberalism. So this is the aspect of the struggle for hegemony, because how we interpret the crisis of neoliberalism will frame the medium and long-term solutions as well as short-term first aid. Nation states will remain the crucial first aiders, but local states will have their own role to play within the development of a solidary global society. And it takes turn to mobilize international responses, but a global solution is needed. The sooner, the better. And that brings me to my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, well, that is enough for uh, the rest of the day, I would say. Um, what you brought up. Um, it's absolutely magnificent uh, that you were able to put that in a kind of uh, semi-mathematical um, table, which uh, will certainly facilitate the discussion. The discussion will start with um, uh, Michael Bri from Berlin, who will comment on this, and I think he, he read the the PowerPoint already before this, otherwise it would be almost impossible for about uh, 15 minutes. Um, I give the floor to uh, Michael Bri. Yes, hi to, to everybody. Good morning to you. Uh, to rephrase uh, former US Secretary of State Colin Powell's, you know it, the known and the unknown. There are four types of challenges to do the possible, to do the impossible, to do the totally impossible, and to comment on a PowerPoint of Bob Jessel. And it's my honor to face the fourth challenge. Uh, at the, and I will concentrate on just on one, one um, problem. In the end of his um, really great uh, presentation, uh, Bob addresses a Green New Deal, and he shows that how capitalist profit producing production, non profit producing, and free time for self realization are interlinked now in an imperial way. And he looks for non imperial mode of production, reproduction, and living. And he asks the famous question by Chernyshevsky or Lenin what is to be done? In this case, and I think it's only in this case, I would like to add to his list one problem. I think one of the central problems to make the imperial mode of production and living history is to build up a class connecting alliances to of transformation to a solidarity based mode of production. And he also stresses, and I want to add something to this, uh, the role of a transformative state. And I want to stress why we, uh, we must concentrate on the problem of, of state. Uh, so the first problem I want to, to discuss very briefly is that uh, one effect of the appeal mode of production, reproduction, and living is that 
it splits not only the global uh, labor classes, but also the labor classes at the national, regional, regional and local levels. The fixes, I think, of the um, post fordist financial market capitalism and its verities are also fixes of a very special class structure and the corresponding political and cultural attitudes of different milieus. So I um, want to show it with a, uh, also with a PowerPoint. Let's see. Yeah, it should be here. Okay, and I start one moment. Um, okay. So um, it's, it's based on a, in a survey done by the Hans Böckler Stiftung close to the German trade unions, and they're using, you know, all this, the, the uh, very well known uh, space of libertarian orientation versus authoritarian orientations orientations toward regu social regulation and orientations toward market regulations. And I want to show what is the problem behind for, um, you see this is a German description and now we see the different uh, groups they um, um, found in the survey. I don't want to go into the concrete terms which are uh, uh, used by the Hans Böckler shift. And what I want to show that you see the, the space is very uh, splitted. And the problem is based on this, on this um, space of milieus, based on the class structure of our societies in the highly developed countries, there are different uh, possible class connecting alliances which can get um, um, majority. The first is what well, is um, um, dominating in Germany, a social basis for modeling so. I think the conservative party, the social democratic party um, are representing this tendency. The second is the new uh, right forces, um, which are uh, connecting um, workers, the precariat, but also the individualistic meritocrats, the achievers, and so on, how they are called in this survey. The problem for, uh, for creating an alliance for solidarity transformation is, as you see, it's, it's a, there's a huge gap between the very different groups which should be connected in such an alliance. And this is very, a very, very difficult task. And until now, we see that uh, in almost all, I think in all European countries, the, the forces for social ecological transformations failed to build up such an alliance. Uh, uh, even now, when we are reading about um, uh, fire in California, about water in New York or in the uh, mountain regions of Germany. Even now, um, we are not able to create such a very strong alliance. So how such an alliance of solidarity and social ecological transformation can come into be being. Um, Bob in his um, PowerPoint, already posed this question with regard to the role of the state um, in, in one of the last um, uh, slides. The problem for building up such a solidaritistic alliance means that we must bring together, bring together uh, especially those who have fewer resources than others. And it's an alliance against the dominating forces, oligarchic forces of the um, dominating appeal mode of production and um, um, living. There's, uh, Jude Delheim uh, is calling them the oligarchy groups of finance, high tech, resource ex extraction, transport, agribusiness, and of course, of the military industrial complex. It's very strong. And a lot of workers and a lot of employees all are connected to this oligarchic structure. We are depending on this oligarchic sector. Germany is depending on the car, um, car exporting and car producing sector, as you know, and so on. All this is very well known, so it's not that they are there and the workers are somewhere else. No, it's a combined force and how to, how to 
um, um, create a possibility to overcome this um, situation where such an oligarchic uh, huge group can dominate the whole mode of production and the whole mode of life. Um, or, um, I think, and this brings the state in, and this is my second problem I, I uh, moment I want to mention. Um, I'm just working on a, on a study on the, on the transition of the United States in 1940, 1942 from peace economy to war economy. And I, I think we should learn from these lessons, not to use the same methods, not to, and so on, but how important a state is to overcome uh, a blockade for such a huge uh, transition, only to give you some figures. Um, um, often now we, we, we hear it, it's totally impossible, we can't, um, can't go on with uh, what Lester Brown, a former um, head uh, of the World Watch Institute, was calling, um, we should do the Green New Deal in a war-like speed and in a war-like scale. That means, and we have lost decades, we have lost at least four decades for this. So now it's really very, very urgent. So what can, can be done? And we see that the idea that it, there is not there aren't enough resources. There is no chance to finance it. If we are looking back to the transition in the US and maybe other countries, of course, to war economy, it's crazy. Um, I'm remembering one sentence of Roosevelt. He said um, when he was explaining this transition the, that never a war was lost because of the lack of finances, of the lack of finances. And why we should lose the, the, um, the task to, uh, for social ecological transformation because of the lack of, lack of finances. Yeah? All, we know it in Germany, we have the Schuldenbremse and all over Europe almost. This is totally crazy. We should overcome this uh, situation. Um, just to give you very brief figures, um, the, the expenditures uh, in the U.S. increased, as you see, from 1.8 billion to 22.9 uh, billion uh, in two years. Um, the military personnel, or so maybe the personnel for for um, the task of transformation, which is a huge uh, task for labor forces, increased also by more than uh, 50, about 50, 15 times. The gross domestic product also of the United States by this task increased. It's also the idea that I, I, I do not know if, as I think uh, for to come to what you are calling both um, a situation of um, uh, non-growth and, and of course of reduction, nevertheless, to come there, we need a lot of lot of uh, investment and 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 hard hard work. Okay, the spending on the military reached about forty five percent of gross domestic product during the same period. Forty five percent. Uh, I looked for very different uh, estimations. The highly developed countries would need now at about seven to ten percent of the of their own gross national product for internal for the internal necessity of transformation, and then of course I think about the same amount, seven to ten percent would be needed for the support, as you also mentioned it in your presentation, for the support of a global transformation. Yeah, it is, must be a solidarity based and um, um, to, uh, just to make this comparison, also the United States during this time supported Great Britain, uh, Soviet Union and uh, China. Um, and um, so the federal budget of the United States for the need of war economy increased from 9 billion to 100 billion in 1945. I, what I want to mention that um, we must be aware that uh, to avoid what you are, what you are, uh, uh, Bob, are calling um, 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 a non -green, also non green, non green, uh, um, green New Deal. Yeah? Uh, to overcome this, we need um, a really different type of state. I would call it um, 
the transformative state. We must fight for a transformative state. Um, and the last also is just a remark. Uh, persons during the war in the United States uh, with an income of more than 1 million had to pay 94% of income tax. Yeah, this is also clear. Okay, so this, I'm coming to the end. What I think the task is if we are, want to make we want to make um, the imperial mode of production, reproduction, and living history. We uh, the task is to work on a transformative triangle. The first is hegemony of a middle bottom alliance of social ecological transformations. That means bridging the contradictions inside the laboring classes in the broad sense. The second is. Um, it's also in your presentation, broad transformative social movements, initiatives, social and economic enterprises. There's a huge potential and we see a lot of developments, but to set all this free and to create such a hegemony, nevertheless, um, uh, one should speak about the transformative state in global solidarity transformation. And to end with a um, uh, advertisement, uh, I also think we need visions. And one of the most beautiful visions in the end of the 19th century was by William Morris. Uh, Edward P. Thompson wrote a very important biography on him. And he wrote, uh, so William Morris wrote the book News from Nowhere uh, or um, uh, Epoch of Rest. And um, so we also need our own visions to overcome this situation of stagnation, of um, pessimism, of fatalism. I think um, to, 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 to organize a political world, which is needed, I think the most important task is to organize such a political world. We also need visions for uh, really lively visions, uh, which are um, helping us to overcome the impasse of the um, uh, interregnum of the crisis of financial market capitalism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. I, I think it's important uh, to stress that uh, Michael wrote a nice book on Lenin, it's only in German. Uh, oh, it's in it's in English. It's in, in English. English. Okay, sorry. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I did that paragraph. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, it's already in English. Be discovering Lenin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one of the big problems, of course, of such a view is the uh, creation of political power, which was one of the obsessions, of course, from the early communists. So um, dreams for Morris is one thing and creating uh, political power structures is a precondition for this. Now we start the discussion, I don't think we discuss uh, the Leninist party theory, but at least um, we have to develop a vision, I think as, as you say, in order to bring people together to create a counter power. There is one question on the, um, Q&A session as again, people who want to uh, put something uh, for discussion can do that in the Q&A, don't use the chat. And um, uh, then uh, Nora uh, Ratzel uh, raised her hand already for discussion. I think the Q&A uh, was um, first. So maybe we do first uh, um, some uh, discussion uh, contributions and then an answer by Bob Biesop. So, Herman, will you please read the, the Q&A? Uh... Yes, <clears throat> I hope the host won't mute me again. Um, we have a question. Is my video on? I'm not sure. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, we have a question. Uh, from attendee Kuboyama. Um, could you explain more and in depth on the emergence of multilateral partnerships, BRICS, in crisis you mentioned, maybe showing some possible cases? Thank you very much in advance. Thank you. Um, the next contribution is uh, 
for Nora Retzel, you have the floor for a short uh, comment, please. Yes, I will be short. <laughs> so my question to Bob Jessup is, um, thank you very much for all these rich analysis. And uh, my question is, can you say something more about the way in which the new, the replacement of Fordism also changes the strategy of hegemony and inclusion of workers, citizens into the system? And um, then I have a comment to Michael Brie. I think that is very important what you said about the necessity to integrate the different social actors for change. And I think it becomes even more important and difficult if we think about that this has to happen globally. I mean, there have to be global solidarity. But there is also a form in which it might be more easy if we look at the way in which workers which are already connected for in the, um, in the value chain, supply chain, how to organize connection between these workers which are already connected, but so to say behind their backs. Thank you, Nora. Then um, Uli was a comment and then uh, the floor is back to Bob Yesop for uh, digesting the questions. Oh, Uli, please. Thank you, um, um, Jos, and thank you, um, Bob and Ma Michael, for this um, fascinating uh, talk and comments. Bob, I, my first point is very close to Nora, and thank you for engaging this, the concept in Promote of Living in this the book. Um, um, I think that you hide a bit in your systematization the aspect of the everyday. You, you uh, talk when you introduce the accumulation regime in your larger PowerPoint, of course, it's about um, the um, complementary pattern of production and consumption. But Alietta, and we refer to this in our book, introduced the concept of the norm of consumption, which is the mode of living of the wage earners. And uh, how, how could we complement this? Would this be kind of another form or is it um, cross-cutting? Or how, just if you, yeah, we, we refer very much to your work on how to complement it um, from our perspective. The second is an um, old debate. We already had it um, many times, but I want to bring it back because we are in a new situation maybe. The spatial temporal fixes is a strong tendency. It's a very, very rich uh, concept. And we also argue like that, and that this is then the externalization, that the stabilization within some regions um, refers systematically to instability. But maybe in the current situation, we need to give up the assumption of stability. There is maybe a wish to stabilize, but in, um, in times of a multiple crisis, maybe we should study much more the forms of instability or the unevenness between stability and instability. And coming from regulation theory, and we will argue also in our presentation uh, in, the, in the, this direction, maybe we overestimate stabilities and the fixes in your, in your language. The third point is more a, a short one, a conceptual one. Um, in our, Markus and ours, in our debates, the term for post fordism uh, no, maybe for the post post fordism is not so much the knowledge based economy, it's the green economy. So, do you see it as complementary? And the green economy has a very material aspect. And of course, you argue, and, and I link also with the imaginaries. Um, you, at the end, you introduce the Green New Deal as a very recent strategy, but we have the green economy debate since 10 years and even more. So how this is complemented or maybe intention, the green economy and dispositive or imaginary intention with the uh, knowledge-based economy. And the last point, and then it's also uh, close to a question I have for Michael. Um, we have discussions, we had the Degross conference in Vienna um, uh, 15 months ago with 4,000 participants, and now we are producing a book. And we try, this comes back to also to Michael's point with the alliances, we have now an informal um, workshop series with the Chamber of Labor in Austria on degrowth and uh, labor issues, which is very, very um, 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 productive. And we need trust, we need this informal gatherings, 20 people every two months to discuss. And 
a question which would arise from Christoph Streisel and others, very smart, engaged people who in the trade union movement who are who sympathize with um, the degrowth perspective, or in your terms, with the ecological friendly no growth regime. Christoph, just an example, would ask. When you go through the forms of capital enterprise form, wage relation state um, and, and societal nature relations, how would it work macroeconomically? So his question would be, as a trade union, a radical trade union thinker, how could we stabilize um, the forms? And uh, again, is this cross-cutting? Is it against um, a chance discovery with LPS? It, it might emerge. Or should we go a bit further and to describe and, and maybe to analyze these um, macroeconomic stabilizing, yeah? Because this is a question he always poses, and this is very serious when we want to convince um, trade union activist thinkers for this. And my last point, I I'm a, a bit long already, is, uh, Michael, thank you very much, and I'm so happy to be now in Berlin and that we have time to discuss this um, in more detail. But I think I, I'm, I, I read your the, the draft of your study, and I find it, very, very important. And to you insist on this, the enormous resources we need. And, and I, I completely agree with this. But I think it's the degrowth perspective is complementary to this. The degrowth is not that we don't need resources. The degrowth is that, that we need to get rid of the capitalist growth imperative. And this is very different. And I, I want to stress this here. Degrowth is not to have less resources. Degrowth is to have another society, but the, the mean, the, the mechanism, the dynamics to get to the society, to the ecological friendly no growth regime in Bob's word, is to counter the capitalist um, uh, growth imperative. And I know from your study that you, you, you didn't um, uh, mention it here, that it, the, the, the um, conversion to the war economy was very, uh, uh, the, the enterprises made a lot of profits. So it was a growth regime, yeah. So how to avoid this? It's, I would say this is a very important and serious question. Thank you again. Thank you, Lisa. I give the floor to Bob again for uh, his answer and followed, I think, then by uh, Michael Bri to um, ask some questions also uh, um, dealing with what he said. And then we go on with a general discussion, Bob, please. Okay. I'll deal with the question from uh, Kubuyama in Japan, first of all, but I explain the multilater multilateral partnership and crisis in BRICS. I think what's interesting is the emergence of the BRICS discourse. Nai Ling has written on this as well. The Brazil, Russia, India, China was an emerging discourse that came to be self-fulfilling with the BRICS summits and so on. And there was a belief that the BRICS developed a new global South Alliance, but we can see that uh, that was an initially um, imagined alliance. And we can see that the uh, economic development of the BRIC economies became increasingly divergent um, and the, uh, really only China uh, was the emerging power. The others are now in crisis in one way or another. So I would argue that the, the BRICS economy was a, an imagined alliance in the global south that had no real basis in the developing economies. It was argued that the uh, the economies would be, for China, it was the factory of the world. For Russia, it was the resource exporting economy in the world. The India would provide the service sector to the world, and Brazil would provide the, the, the resources to the world as well. And this hasn't worked out at all as a result of the emergence of the different regimes and their differential growth. So when I was talking about the multilateral partnerships, this was one way to think about how would the global south emerge. And I was talking about the brick economies as an imagined solution that hasn't, hasn't worked out. And this is one aspect of the crisis in the global south that has not responded adequately to the crisis in the global north 
except insofar as China is now an imperial rival, as Nai Ling pointed out yesterday, to the global north and the United States in particular. But this is still not resolved. In terms of Nora's question, which is to do with the strategy of workers and how they're integrated into the system, I want to argue that the ways in which they're integrated was the institutionalized class compromise in Atlantic Fordism. That is to say that skilled workers and semi-skilled workers in the productive sectors generalize their norms of consumption and production through the development of the welfare state so that norms of mass consumption uh, were generalized to other workers, not in the Fordist sectors. And this was primarily through the development of Keynesianism, which committed to maintaining a full employment level of demand and the development of the welfare state which generalized norms of consumption, mass consumption, to other workers, whether they were in the workforce or not. So whether you were retired, unemployed, um, pregnant, or bringing up children, and so on, you were involved in work, the welfare state, so that when demand fell off, and it was um, at a full employment level, there was compensation from the welfare state. And I think after the crisis of the welfare state, we have saw the rise of austerity and the attempt to impose productivity. And the neoliberal state is committed not to full employment, but to conditions of full employability. And that makes the workers more self-reliant and self-responsible for their whether they're employed or not. And this develops the idea of the entrepreneurial self and promoting entrepreneurial culture as part of that. So I think we're seeing the rise of a more exclusionary and a more authoritarian state, which is no longer dependent on the institutionalized class compromise. And I think that Mikhail Bree's presentation uh, based on his uh, German uh, work, is very good because he identifies possible alliances and in particular emphasizes the importance of academic groups, which is an important part of Gramsci's theory of hegemony, which is to identify the organic intellectuals who may be part of a compromise to develop a sustainable green economy. In terms of Uli's work uh, questions, he asked about norms of mass cons norms of consumption. This was an important part of the regulation theoretical approach because they emphasized that different accumulation regimes involve different balances between mass consumption and mass production. So we can think of the contrast between Germany, say, and Britain in terms of Germany being an export-oriented economy, which needs to control the wages of workers in the export-oriented sectors in order to ex be able to continue to export, whereas the United Kingdom and the United States were much more wage-led growth, domestic wage-led growth rather than export-led growth. And so we see different norms of consumption and production in Germany compared with more liberal economies like Britain and the United States. And the same problems would be there in terms of the everyday, in terms of either the knowledge-based economy or finance-dominated accumulation. One would have to define the, the norms of production and consumption in these regards. In terms of whether or not the regulation approach was too concerned with stability and not concerned enough with crisis, I think this is an important point. And I think the one of the reasons why the regulation theory crisis developed um, its own crisis theoretically is its concern with focusing on regulation 
and its interesting regulation theory was displaced by governance theory, which is much more provisional, ad hoc, and so forth. And I think governance is what displaced regulation theory in academic terms and brought the questions of crisis management crisis stabilization, crises of crisis management to the fore. And I think that would be an important part of how we think about post-Fordism, whether it's knowledge-based economy, finance-dominated accumulation, or a sustainable green economy. In terms of work on the green economy, uh, I was particularly inspired by Elmer Altparter's work on the green economy where he shows that there are many varieties of what the green economy means, from no growth, no green economy, a sort of fictitious fake green economy to a really serious one. And what I've been trying to think about in my presentation is what would be the conditions for a green solar economy based on global solidarity rather than um, uh, a profits-oriented, neoliberal, captured green economy. And I think the ideas of Michel Ri there also on the transformative state and the types of class alliance would be important in that regard. And I think I've dealt with most of the questions that have been directed at me, and we can now turn to Michel Ri. Thank you, Bob. So um, I give the floor to Michal Tavaric, Michal Bri, and <laughs> the question. Uh, I will be very brief, Ms. Kord. I think this is a very important question. Thank you, firstly, Nora, for the reference to value chains and all what is uh, building up uh, solidarity at, uh, with regard to the value chains and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation with its offices around the world. Uh, tries to do uh, to support such a tendency. I want to uh, uh, come back to two problems Uli uh, posed. The first is uh, the question of the trade unions you were quoting, the problem of um, a new regime of uh, macroeconomic stability in the process of transition. Uh, what I learned by, by looking on the transition to, to a war economy is that it was a very open search process at the bottom and the enterprise level, at the regional levels and at the top level. Yeah? And what was, I think, is important is as you, you can't, you can't um, forecast how it will work. Uh, 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 it's really open. What is important is the will to do it, the organizing of learning and supporting this learning and also to uh, to uh, give uh, to um, set free resources uh, for this process and of course securing at, at especially for those who are weaker um, some form of um, security I think uh, the proposal by the Green New Deal in the United States by Alessandro Octavio Cortez yeah that um, uh, uh, safe uh, safe jobs and safe income, yeah, not the, the, the jobs in the old industries, but really a transition for new jobs with with um, good wages and so on is very very important. And I also totally agree with this. I don't uh, the the transition to work economy in the US was a breakthrough of Fordism and the. Uh, this is totally clear. It was not done during the green, uh, the old New Deal, but during the war. Yeah, uh, only by and this is important. Only by the impact of this huge transfer, it's also state-led trans, uh, transfer of resources, this breaks through to uh, Fordism, mass consumption, and so on. To the welfare state was possible, and of course. If you are looking now, uh, what was discussed during the war? Of course, there was a discussion. Should it benefit mostly the corporations? Should the corporations be the most important actors or others? Yeah. So it was an open dispute between the new dealers and the alliance of the uh, the military and the corporations. And uh, in the end, 
the alliance of the military and the corporations won this battle. And of course, we should be aware that it should be totally different. But to, to set free the whole potential of a new type uh, of um, 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 uh, community-based and regional and local-based economy without the, what you are uh, uh, stressing, without the imperative of growth, we need, um, we need the uh, alliance between a transformative state and all these initiatives only together yeah, and to make it clear that it means to end with this oligarchic structures which try to capture now what um, Bob was saying, uh, the, the, the Green New Deal to the, for their own purposes to, to uh, go further on. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next um, discussion is uh, Dr. Lawson from Denmark here in the room in Amsterdam. Can I unmute myself? Yeah, please unmute yourself. Um, your camera. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, it's it's a it's a comment to uh, to uh, Michael. Um, I think that it's uh, the question of the American uh, war economy was not just uh, resources. It was also that it, it turned uh, into a, a, a planned economy. It was political uh, decisions who uh, directed the uh, money. For instance, with the decision to develop uh, the atomic bomb, a lot of resources was uh, uh, put into that uh, purpose, and it was a, a political de decision. So it's a combination of, of resources and uh, plan uh, economy. And I think actually we have now uh, 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 another example. Uh, suddenly uh, in, the pan in the pandemic, uh, uh, states find enormous uh, resources uh, billions, uh, if not uh, trillions of uh, uh, dollars is uh, mobilized, uh, but it's mobilized uh, not to change the uh, capitalist economy, but uh, to uh, save it. It's a kind of, uh, uh, Naomi Klein calls it a corona uh, uh, capitalism, and it has certainly a, a, a Keynesian uh, aspect uh, in it as the states go in as a savior of the capitalist system. Uh, uh, but now it's a, it, it's a, it's not the social democratic states as in third, it, it's a kind of neoliberal state, uh, which go in and, and pump out thousands of billions of dollars to keep up the uh, consumption and thereby in employment and uh, keep the uh, profit up. And, um, but this money are mobilized to save uh, the system. They are not directed into change the, the system, which was, uh, suppo uh, was supposed to be if you had to uh, solve the uh, uh, climate uh, crisis. I think also this combination of the resources and plan economy, the strength of this is uh, shown in the development of the uh, China as uh, uh, Mark uh, told us yesterday, China in 1949 was one of the mo most poor countries in the world. But it's this combination in directing resources and planned economy, which now one of the biggest uh, economies in, in the world. And this has happened in the space of, of, of 50 years. So I think actually China is an example of a transformed uh, state. Thank you. Um, I'd rather people who want to bring in something on Marcel. Yeah. Um, just a, a question, I think, especially for, for uh, Bob, about, uh, am I in, in the picture? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Wait, I don't see myself, okay. Um, yeah. It is about, it is about, uh, labor 
the, the wage labor, which is, of course, extremely important in, in the advanced capitalist countries now, according to the ILO, 90% of the labor force is in wage labor. In the global south, it's, uh, of course, a much lower percentage. But if we look at this, uh, at wage labor in the, in the context of what you have described, then uh, I have a following question. The re relative growth of wage labor since the 19th century um, has, of course, also led to a diminished importance of forced labor in general and uh, chattel slavery in particular. And uh, why did wage labor, so-called free wage labor, become so dominant in uh, the capitalist, the world capitalist society? I think one important reason was that uh, slaves and other unfree workers earn very little money or no money, and therefore have no consumer power. While for the circulation of uh, uh, money and capital, uh, it is important to have consumers who can spend money. So for, and for that reason, I think it was a crucial reason why wage labor was necessary for the expansion of uh, capitalism in the 20th century. If we now see uh, the decline of the Fordist arrangement, which is based on the circulation uh, and, and the feedback of uh, money from working class families to capital and so on, uh, then the question emerges, will we in the coming years, decades, see also a return to some extent of unfree labor and slavery? It's because uh, it's thinkable that uh, a part of the uh, labor force in the world uh, can do its work without or remuneration or little remuneration, while another part of the uh, world working class uh, continues to earn money in wage for, uh, uh, wages in, in money form. Okay. Um... I think this question is uh, for it for Bob. So let me answer. And I think the, uh, <clears throat> the development of the world market has um, obviously associated with the generalization of the commodity form to wage labor. And we see the development of the world market being involved with the reduction initially of chattel slavery and slavery. I think the question about the development of the Global South, however, is that a large part of the initial growth of the Global South, as many people have pointed out, was its export-led orientation. So the Global South was associated with uh, repressive labor regimes, which kept wage wages at export sustaining levels. So the ability to export was dependent on reduced or below mass consumption level wages. And we see, for example, in Korea, Ricardian. Hmm? Ricardian. Nyling described it as a Ricardian workfare. So we're trying to exploit the most abundant resources in the global south. It was wage labor and resources and trying to exploit those and export them uh, in terms of cheap wage labor produced goods. However, as the growth of democracy shows, for example, in South Korea, as democratization in South Korea emerged, we began to see the development of demands for higher wages. And we see a shift then in terms of the global hierarchy to other sources of demand. And South Korea organizes its own regional division of labor, exploiting cheap labor elsewhere. And I think what we're seeing is the development of cons mass consumer goods wages in terms of the model of peripheral Fordism, so that um, the middle classes in peripheral Fordist economies are sustaining mass consumption level wages and we're seeing with rising productivity higher wages uh, emerging for uh, 
um, peripheral Fordist workers. Um, but whether this is sustainable or not, I'm not sure. And I think, uh, as Marcel points out, there is a growing precarity also in the global south, which is associated with divisions between uh, organized workers and non-organized workers, more precarious workers, more marginal workers, and so on. And the problem is whether this is sustainable in terms of the maintenance of the global economy. Or we're seeing a diffusion and uh, growing contradictions between different varieties of capitalism within the global south as well as the global north. However, I'm not prepared to predict, as I think Marcel is inviting me to do, that we will see an increase in chattel slavery or slavery. Uh, but I think we will see a growing marginalization of uh, precarious workers in the global south as in the global north. And this requires a solidarity between workers on a global level. And I think one of the points here that I'd introduce into my presentation is that key part of the development of global solidarity will be to take Marx's argument in the various um, parts of capital and elsewhere, that once truly free, only in one's free time and not in terms of one's wage labor. And so the distribution of free time uh, would be one of the ways in which one could develop solidarity. So distributing the hours worked so that people have more free time to take part in democratic participation, to develop solidarity, to develop themselves would be a key part of the development of global solidarity. And I think this is implied in Mikhail Bree's um, analysis of how one can develop global solidarity in terms of the groups that are marginalized but still support the social market uh, in the um, global system. So we need to think of global solidarity, so solar solidarity, also in terms of how free time is expanded for all workers and not just concentrated in the rich and so on. So how we mobilize free time and distribute free time in a global basis is an important part of the development of a new mode of living, which is global, but not imperial. Thank you, Bob. Well, I don't see any hands or question and answers. Is there anybody, we still have uh, roughly 15 minutes for this session. Uh, is there anybody who wants to intervene or discuss something at this moment? If there is uh, none, then we can close this session. What? Uh, what? Okay, yeah, yeah, you, you correct, Marcel. Um, if I could put a question to uh, Michael Bree, so um, he has to answer that question. Uh, Michael, you have the floor. This, I seems I missed the question. Please repeat it to me. Hmm? Sorry. Hmm? So can you please repeat the question? Uh, my question was um, that uh, you study the U.S. war economy. And I, I, I was just uh, underlining that it's not just a question of resources. It was also a question of planned economy, yeah, yeah. That, that, that it was the political decision who decided uh, what should be done and what should not be done and where resources should go. And, and, and I see this effectiveness of, of the, of planned economy also, for instance, in, uh, in uh, China, in this combination of planned economy and uh, resources to, uh, uh, to, uh, make a rapid uh, transformation of an, uh, economy. 
I found I, I answered to you via via the chat already. Yeah, no, no. I, I think this is. I, I just took it as a as a important additional uh, um, point, and I totally agree with this. Yeah, of course. Um, the, uh, the such a huge transformation must be uh, connected with planning at different levels, starting from the community uh, communal level up to the uh, to the uh, state uh, national level and uh, European level, and even the pro whole problem of uh, maybe at the global level at somehow at least for very important resources. And we know it. Um, um, and I to also. Very, I'm very glad that you are referring to China. China is, of course, the elephant in the room for all of us, I think. And um, we, uh, the, uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation is trying to study extensively the Chinese experiences because what we have said, uh, they are very effective. And this was also somehow done um, in, in the US during the war, combining state planning Empowering, of course, also from below. There was tendency of this um, from below trade unions at the, the enterprise level, also controlling the inflation by uh, civil society organizations um, uh, and, and uh, with uh, entrepreneurship. And I think we should overcome this dichotomy of plan versus market versus civil uh, civil society. Uh, I think, Bob, you also in your, your presentation are making this point. They can be um, each other enforcing in a positive or in a negative sense, of course. It can be planning for, uh, for the oligarchic um, strengthening or it can be planning for um, a, a real uh, transformation and uh, toward um, the gross um, economy. So I, I totally agree with this. It's that why I didn't uh, took it as a question. Sorry for that. Yeah, I, no, but it's very important. So there is a case now, and we should see if um, I agree also with this that if China uh, uh, can become an example of a transformative state. Of course, we know also the problems with the Chinese state and with this regard. Yeah. But nevertheless, we should study it uh, as a, and what I found very interesting is that for the first time since the end of the Soviet Union, the European Union and also US are looking on another state as a system rival. Yeah, this is, I think, important because it's opening up the space. There are possibilities to do it differently. Uh, we should not, we should not take what China is doing, but we can say there are possibilities to do it differently. So let's try it to do it our way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So China is a proof of concept that there is a possibility to overcome the Western type of capitalism. Uh, well, there are no other comments, so we can close the session a bit earlier and you can stretch your legs and brains. Uh, and then we reconvene at um, uh, 1.30, half past one o'clock, uh, with the second session where um, Uli Brandt and Markus Wiesen will give the, um, the talk for the rest of today. Thank you very much for the time now and uh, looking forward to seeing you and hearing you in uh, one hour and a half.